Hey, I'm Daniel, and for this episode of The Film Craziest Show, I was joined by guests, writer and director Ted Nicolau, as well as Lauren Doctor, who plays the villain in the film Serena, and Cole Pendery, who plays Ben in the new horror film Don't Let Her In, about a couple who rent out their loft in Los Angeles to a mysterious new tenant, Serena, in a film that calls to mind Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> it's now streaming on Charles Band's streaming service Full Moon Features, which is fullmoonfeatures.com as well as on Amazon Prime in the U.S. It's a fun conversation, and here's Lauren Doctor to introduce us. Hi, my name is Lauren Doctor, and I play the role of Serena, and you are watching the film Craziest Show. Hi, I'm Cole Pendry. I play Ben and Don't Let Her In, and you're watching the film Craziest Show. Hi, I'm Ted Nicolau. I wrote and directed Don't Let Her In, and this is the film Craziest Show. And I'm Daniel, the host of the Film Crazy Show. It's great to have you guys here to chat about Don't Let Her In. Cool. Thanks for having us. To start, is this is this a movie or is it like a two-part miniseries? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, for some reason, Charlie decided this year he wanted to make two-parters. Little, They're like kind of short story horror films uh, told in two parts. Um, so that's what it is. It's like... Uh, a two-parter episodic that and and maybe I guess if if people like it enough maybe Charlie's plan is to expand the universe of each of the different stories that he's telling and so maybe there could be more episodes okay sorry and Charlie's your produ- one of your producers oh Charles Band uh, Charles Band of Full Moon Entertainment uh who is the impresario behind a bazillion science fiction fantasy and horror films so he just kind of, so that decision, was that decision made when you were writing it or like in the production side? Uh, no, the decision to, to divide these stories into two parts was made even before I came on board. Charlie proposed it to me as this is what he was going to be doing for a streaming platform uh, for this year, like uh, little half hour episodic stories. Did, did you want to plug the, the streaming platform? I think it's called Full Moon, Fe- yeah, Full Moon yeah. Features. Yeah, so if you're interested in seeing any of these movies, uh, especially Don't Let Her In, because that's the one you really should see first, you can find it on the Full Moon streaming uh, app, uh, which you can, if you don't have the money to buy a monthly subscription, you can at least get a week free. It's also available on Amazon Prime uh, for a small rental fee. And on Amazon Prime, the, the movie's in 4K, Ultra HD, so it looks super good. Mm-hmm. Okay, it looked pretty good on the Vimeo too. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had uh, our director of photography, uh, Howard Wexler, did a great job kind of lighting it. And our production designer, Dave Lowe, dressed the set beautifully. And we had a really great set. And then we had some beautiful people in front of the camera. So mm. yeah, it looks good. Yeah, the, the cast is only what, four people? Yeah, uh, primarily only three people. Uh, True. designed that way on purpose because we really wanted to tell a story as efficiently as possible with uh, the the one location and the smallest cast that I could possibly use to tell the story just as kind of an experiment and also to help us get more on the screen in the budget and the schedule that we had to work with. Okay. For, for Lauren and Cole, was that a bit more intimate for you guys just with the small cast? Um, I'd say so. Yeah. Um, I think we all got to know each other pretty well, which was great. Um, and it didn't feel like, you know, in between, like beyond working together on set, we like didn't, we got to time when we weren't filming to like chat and get to know each other. You know, some projects you're just like flown onto set and you just do your scene and you leave and you never really talk to that person again. Um, we, it was, we were privileged enough to be able to get to know each other pretty well. So that was great. Yeah, that was really nice. We all became a really, you know, tight knit little group in a, a week of shooting, which was fun. But also I think it's cool to have a smaller cast and more focused energies. You know, we all really cared about the project and wanted to make it the best as possible. So there wasn't as many cast members to, you know, distract time behind the set and everything. So we all just kind of 
were really focused on getting the job done and really wanted to just make sure we all knew what the next scene was going to feel like and and could just you know run over all of our notes and ideas and everything and and so with the kind of honed in little group it, I think it flowed really really well so it was really fun to experience that. Okay now Cole you kind of get sidelined in a way because you, it sounds like feels like you kind of fly in and then leave so like how many days were you on set for? I was on set every day um, okay. so yeah that was that was nice I didn't do a lot every day but I was there every day and because um, you know in, in when you're filming a, a movie it's you're all over the place in the script. So I would need to show up some, a couple days I got let go early. So I got to go get some sleep uh, a bit sooner than everyone else. And they were jealous, but, um, but yeah, so I was there and just had a great time. Even when I wasn't working, we had some good crafty and just good people behind the scenes that I got to chat with and learn from. So it was great. Okay, so when you were FaceTiming, you were just in the other room kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like the stairwell of the building, and <laughs> and one of the scenes, I was um, downstairs in our little cafeteria where we were eating lunch. <laughs> okay, movie magic. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> now, I, I, I wanted to ask about the set here. I just have the, the Nate Starkman building, which is used as patties, and it's always sunny in Philadelphia, and even Nick Cage's apartment in National Treasure. What was what was it like uh, filming there for you guys? God, okay, Lauren. Oh no, yeah, it was it was cool. I I mean, that area of downtown is so awesome, and you only really I mean, if you don't live there, you're kind of just going for you know maybe to a cafe or to dinner, and then you leave. Like I never really spent that much time in that neighborhood, so it almost felt like because it was just one location, it felt like home. Like after seven days of or after like the seventh day of filming, not driving there was such a weird feeling. I was like, oh, I, <laughs> I live there. <laughs> so weird. Um, but it's a beautiful building. I mean, I don't know when it was built, but it has like kind of a, it, there's something like not only historical, but it feels like there's some pr a, a different sort of presence that exists in that building. Like you feel like there's, there have been a lot of lives who have come come in and out of that building. So there was something a little haunted about it, but in a good way. Okay, a lot of history. Yeah, mm -hmm. what do you think about it, Ted? You know, when I first uh, started writing the script, one of my first steps is to kind of go online and look for photographs of things that, uh, that kind of would help me express what the film could eventually look like. And uh, one of the first images I found looking for uh, uh, loft space, downtown LA loft space was the Nate Starkman building. And I was like, wow, that place is incredible. And then we went out location scouting and uh, found out in my imagination, I was thinking of the LA arts district from 15 years ago when I'd go down there to punk clubs or 20 years ago, or God knows how many years ago. Uh, and uh, it was really kind of a very desolate and scary kind of place to go. Now it's all, every building has been redone and everything's all fancy and there's a million people walking their dogs down there. And in the middle of all of this construction of like the Sixth Street Bridge and a giant excavation for a new big building and buildings that have been transformed into art lofts stands this wreck of a building, the Nate Starkman building. And uh, I drove past it one day and went, holy shit, this is the building that I love so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, the man who bought it, bought it like in 1980s for a ridiculous amount of money, not very much, and just keeps it as a location, a film location now, because that it's exciting for him and he digs it. And, um, and so it's a really incredible place to work. And we were lucky enough that Charlie Band, our producer, made a deal that was, you know, uh, cheaper than the normal location fee that you have to pay for that place. And so that became our home for that week. And it, and it was incredible. It's got that's so all. much character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool to hear it from that point of view. Um, mm -hmm. Makes it even more exciting. Yeah, it really does feel like the last remainder of the <laughs> old, you know, downtown district. Um, so that's really neat. But yeah, it was really cool to know how much um, has gone on there as far as like filming and 
different projects because we looked through the list too and and I thought it was funny that in National Geographic Nicolas Cage's character is Ben and so I was like oh, oh wow power of Ben in this building <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no it was really cool man six degrees of Ben <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it is cool though like old Los Angeles still like cemented right as new Los Angeles is coming so yeah it's nice cool that that I love that kind of old the old architecture of Los Angeles and the desolate kind of areas of downtown LA and there still are some that exist but it's getting harder and harder to find so it's great that a building like that exists now you you had meant like how much would it be to rent a place like that for a week on that uh, usually uh, I think his standard fee for studio movies is like six thousand dollars a day. Oh, uh, yeah. I was. I, I thought you were going to say six thousand for the week. I was like, that's not too bad. No, no, we got it for a really great price, which I can't d disclose. But uh, six thousand a day, man, that's a expensive location. Only big films can afford that, you know. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> Now, the, the very slow uh, elevator, you use that for kind of comedic effect in the second part. But I'm curious, Ted, if you ever wanted to use it as like for a big horror sequence. Uh, you know, in my imagination, maybe if, if it was funny, that's not that great, man. Uh, <laughs> but in my mind, I thought that was going to be the suspenseful uh, moment as the elevator was coming up and Serena is looking up with that crazed look on her face and... Uh, Amber is like uh, pouring the salt on the on the floor and the elevator's coming and Lauren, uh, to me, I, I, I spent a lot of time he actually with the sound effects designer kind of going, okay, this, the elevator has to have like unique kind of personality of the sound because in the last act of the story, its arrival is gonna signal something terrible that we hopefully that'll be suspenseful. But you were just laughing all the fucking way through it, huh? <laughs> my, my sense of humor is kind of broken, but just how, just how slow it is and just her looking down and her looking up, it's just like, it's just snail yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, it's like, it is kind of funny, I guess, when you think of it, that, that the person who's coming to do you evil is kind of limited by, <laughs> by the technology of 1920, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. But it is pretty suspenseful, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, that's what it was supposed to be. And and you know, at a certain point when the shooting schedule, we I had a couple of more scenes that were supposed to take place around the the elevator. And by that time, we had just shot so many coming, and going, standing by, talking from it that that I just went, no, no, no. That's enough elevator. We'll move this scene outdoors. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm curious the size of the, the crew as well, because it's a, like three actors at a time mostly. What was the size of the crew for this? Uh, probably 20 people maximum. Like okay. uh, it was only one makeup artist, right? For all three of you? Yeah. And then when I when we got um, the prosthetics, there was Greg, but yeah, just one. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, director of photography and uh, camera a focus puller for him and a second camera operator generally uh, and no script supervisor uh, an AD who who had not really done much ADing before but just helped to kind of keep people moving and, and kind of organized uh, yeah it was super super tight little crew okay now now talking about how many spoilers can we get into uh you know, like, uh, I guess, you know, the movie's been out for a couple of weeks, so if somebody <laughs> okay. hasn't seen it yet, you know. They, they don't deserve to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, if uh, let's just make an announcement here. There might be some spoilers ahead, so stop watching, go rent the movie, and then come back. There okay. you go. All right, cool. Now, uh, I don't even know if I'll get into too many, like, specific spoilers, but, like, I thought she was a succubus in the first, like, part, because she's, like, the first part's a bit more sensual kind of thing and then the second part is more into the horror so like so she's a demon kind of succubus yeah i think so lauren what do you think she is i've seen people say she's a vampire and maybe that's just because i've done those vampire movies but um but yeah maybe what the do you teeth. Think? I don't know. a succubus is interesting yeah. um 
I didn't think of that. I I thought that she was a demon, but I guess a succubus is a demon as well, aren't they? Yeah, that comes to you in your sleep and does what you did to them. Yeah, so, so sort that's of an true. interesting theory. Um, <clears throat> and then and they do kind of a, attack through like you know sexual transmission, sexually transmitted fluids. So <laughs> I guess it could be a succubus, but I, in my mind, she was a demon, just a demon with an okay. agenda. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Demon with a sexual horny agenda. Demon. Times. Who, yeah, she was, she was a horny demon. <laughs> now, uh, what was it like developing the mannerisms? Like, like your, like the way you kind of do your hands at the side there. <laughs> that was kind of a collaboration. I mean, I feel like I, in between a few takes, I went into like the one of the free rooms that wasn't we weren't using, and I was just kind of like moving around and kind of feeling how you know this person or this demon would move and i came up with that and then once i was chanting it kind of i it, it it i kind of it started like happening in my body when i was chanting and then ted was like oh i like that go with that so then i continued to go with it and then the hands was I, ted's idea and it, i feel like it was kind of kind of an homage to nosferatu Ted, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We sort of used a little bit of that kind of mannerism and subspecies too, and and all of that is a uh, is a nod to Nosferatu for sure. Yeah. Yeah. When Lauren did those those movements, I had been uh, uh, in my imagination after she did the succubus thing with um, Ben and Amber. I wanted her to exit the room in some very freaky way but I didn't know how in the hell to express it or to even do it. I knew it was going to be sped up and had to be a really odd manner of walking. And when Lauren started doing those kind of mannerisms, it just, it was like, wow, that just solved the problem right there. Can you do, can you walk like that uh, across a whole room, you know? And it, I, I bet your legs were a little sore after that night. They honestly weren't, surprisingly. All those hours at the gym really, uh, really helped. What was it? The, the mirror, how did you come up with that? Uh, you know, I wanted to be able to distort the building and distort the, the view from Amber's eyes. And uh, the truth is, um, I used to make uh, kind of behind the scenes little documentaries and stories for Disney uh, for their classic movies. And I got to look at this book that was like only discovered in later years that, a, that a, one of the uh, special effects technicians kept of all the records of the book of the special effects for the movie Fantasia. And he took photographs and he documented everything very well. And in the demons flying uh, sequence of Fantasia, when the, the, the demon is on the mountaintop, they shot uh, uh, like dead ghosts flying through distorted mirrors. And they, oh. and they shot them in these reflected mirrors and it gave a real fun house kind of look to it. So uh, Howard Wexler, the director of photography and I began this hunt for some kind of flexible, very optically kind of clear mirror material so we could try to use that for distortion. It took a lot longer to set up each shot so we didn't do as many shots as we initially intended to. But that was the thing, it was like from the, the, the um, Schulteis notebook uh, wow. of uh, Disney. That's cool. that's, yeah, it, it's such an incredible thing. If you ever go to the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco, you can see the book and see uh, blown up images from it. It's, it's a phenomenal document of special effects cool. of that era. Now, now contextually, you used that when she was going backwards? Yeah, so you had to, okay. so, so basically sh we filmed Lauren coming to the camera and then we reversed the action and sped it up. Um, uh, and we also used it uh, on some shots of the building where the building starts warping when uh, Serena is doing her chanting. Yeah, that's, that's awesome trivia. A little bit of Disney and- Yeah, uh, and yeah a little Disney in. lore, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Lauren, was it fun for you playing the villain? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would okay. love to only 
exclusively play villains. <laughs> <laughs> Have you played one before? Um, no, no, had not. In college, I did a production of Macbeth and I played Lady Macbeth. And I, okay. I felt such a kinship to that character. And I feel like she's stayed with me for, since I've played her. And I'm like, I just like, so, I mean, that's the ultimate villain, right? So there's something with villains. I just, I really, I really get them and they get me. Okay. So <laughs> that prepared you for the sweet side, but then the very conniving side. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. Cool. Now, Cole, you, you had mentioned before the conversation that you do music. So was that kind of meta for you playing a bit of a rock star here? Yeah, it, was, um, it wasn't It was too too far of a reach for me to try to get in the head of Ben. Um, so yeah, you know, I just I had to be a little bit more rude than I like to be. Um, and, uh, you know, get to play that up a bit, very arrogant self-centered uh rock star um but yeah it was it was a lot of fun to uh to play ben for sure when we were casting for ben one of the things i really uh, asked the casting directors to search for was uh, a real musician to play that part because for me musicians have a certain kind of quality it's cool or something that an actor can try to act but musicians just sort of carry that with them and I don't know why that is or but it's yeah I found it to be true and and uh Cole just brought that to the set perfectly you know thank you okay so you, you don't you don't seem arrogant in real life so you kind of had to play to that hey eh? <laughs> yes my uh my mom and dad made sure that I wasn't one of those guys uh, growing up. but I had I had to turn it on for Ben, that, that, that's what one of the, after we did the table, because we did a Zoom table read, because COVID is still a thing. And after the table read, Ted texted me or emailed me, was like, hey man, did really great, but w- one thing, just bring a little bit more of that arrogance to Ben, because uh, you're a really funny guy. I'm like, get forward, brother. I got you. I got you. Almost too nice. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it, it, trust me. I it, It's, um, I've gotten walked all over. It's my Piscean <laughs> nature. I, uh, nice of a guy. I need to put a wall up. So actually, Ben helped me. I, I carry a little bit of him with me nowadays. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, also, sorry, just going back to the, the monster for a sec. What was the makeup like? Because I always love to ask about, like, creature design. Um, Like, how was it to wear? Yeah, and then I guess for Ted, too, just designing it. So it was, um, I'd never worn a prosthetic before and it was really light. So it kind of just felt like a a sheet mask on your face. Um, It was really relaxing to put on too. Like there's something- Uh, That's funny. (laughs) The the action, the, the, the prosthetic itself was really relaxing but then the contacts were really crazy. Um, But yeah, the actual prosthetic was was not really the hardest part. Um, I thought it was going to be like the most grueling four hour process, and it really wasn't. How long did it take to put on? I feel like about two hours. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, only half that. That's 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 pretty good then. Yeah. Yeah, right for me, from my point of view, uh, it the whole design process started, you know, in the very beginning when I was looking at photographs online and, and trying to find buildings and interior design and uh, and demon images just to kind of assemble some images in order to convey to somebody else kind of what kind of demon that, that we were hoping to achieve. And um, so uh, I found an image I liked and kind of pass that along to our producer, Charles Band, and then we pass that along to Greg, and and then Greg took that and as an inspiration and then kind of came back with some other designs that were, that were, you know, I said, you know, this is just an inspiration, but give me what you see too, you know? So he did, we refined it over a couple of uh, steps. 
one point, uh, the teeth were a little stubbier and not very sharp. And I said, can you make the teeth more sharp? Uh, but I meant more sharp, not like so long that, that it makes it impossible for Lauren to speak, you know, but, but because it was COVID no, we didn't really see anything until the day of shooting. And, and, um, so when I walked into the room and saw the mask on Lauren's face, it was freaky looking the, the actual demon face, but the teeth were like, Oh my God, we've got a problem now. Can you open your mouth and form words? <laughs> and it wasn't really easy for her. So, but the thing with a with a prosthetic like that, the actor has to really act the and make the mask kind of uh, come to life, you know. And and Lauren was able to do that, you know, and really uh, took what what is like this bunch of plastic on her face and and made it have character and and so so we ended up just you know having her do the dialogue and then redid the dialogue in post so that uh so that she could actually be understood hmm. but it's all a matter of acting with that mask and that's like a really great skill now yeah like do, could we see your eyes when you had the mask on i can't remember yeah so you you act with your eyes a lot like what is that what you've always done, just be expressive with your eyes? I think I was just, you know, born with these eyeballs. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was just, you know, knew I had to use them. Um, no, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's something I've had to like tone down a bit too, because I, you know, I have, I hold a lot of like tension in my eyes. So I've had to like, kind of disperse more attention to the rest of my face um just because it's like <laughs> can be really just jarring when it's just like only eyeballs acting at you um yeah no it's just you know it's just my eyes okay <laughs> were the were the contacts uncomfortable yeah so that was that was the hardest part um because i'd never worn contacts before and when i met with greg originally to fit the teeth and the prosthetic it's like, oh yeah, like you're gonna have contacts. Like, it's gonna be fine, you know. Like, if you've never worn contacts before I, during Hall, he's like, I don't wear contacts, but on Halloween I put them in. It takes like you know 20 minutes. Meanwhile, when I started to put them in, really fast, I quickly I learned that they weren't gonna go in my eye. Like my eyeball was just rejecting the contact <laughs> so much so that they ended up having to just kind of pin me down and hold my eyelid open. Um, so that oh. was crazy. Didn't you but, have to like sign a, a release or like a, on video say, I'm not going to sue you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So that was a weird thing. I guess like they're, t you're taught in makeup school to never put a contact in someone's eye, but it's like, inevitably you're going to do, I think that's just to save face. Cause they're like the sec, like after 20 minutes, they both looked at each other and we're like, okay, so we're going to do this even though they gave me a whole spiel about how makeup artists can never put a contact in an actor's eye. Clearly they do. Um, Cause there's no other way someone would get it in their eye. So they were like, okay, so you have to record yourself saying that we, I, you won't sue us if we damage your eye. That was oh, kind of wow. scary. I was like, wow. Oh, oh man. Um, but they it's were horrifying. fine. And it was so it, like, it, it was best that they did it, honestly. Now, were they off screen kind of threatening, threatening you to do that in the video? <laughs> no, 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 they were like, you know, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Okay. But I mean, you know, not going to like do the whole prosthetic without the eyeballs. That would be, that would have been a post. That would have been a nightmare for yeah, post. Those contacts were really cool. Like, yeah. They were freaky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, to the next level. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, last one about the creature. I just, I kind of wanted to hear about the story behind, uh, like in the credits, like your character kind of shimmies across the screen and stamps the, with the full <laughs> moon, number 345. What, what, what's the story behind that one, Ted? Uh, I think that is because Charlie Band has uh, kind of been counting his productions since as long as I've known him. Uh, and I think it's, um, um, it's sort of like the provenance of, uh, a piece of art or something, you know, like, or of a, of a run of posters. So these are, that's his way of kind of keeping track of, 
of the the numbers of productions that he's got. And, and for these latest films, I've never seen it before, uh, but for these last films, uh, he's got this little animated thing coming in and stamping. And I presume on Gingerweed Man, it must be the Gingerweed Man animated coming in. And Gingerweed Man? Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not a full moon guy, huh? You don't watch full moon movies? No, <laughs> to be honest, no. I think I had, I think I actually, yeah, now that you're mentioning it, I had seen something about a gingerbread man, but I did not read it correctly that it's ginger weed man. There's a, well, there was a ginger uh, dead man, and then there's a ginger weed man because he's got a bunch of movies about uh, uh, like evil bong and, and a bunch of weed comedy fantasy films. But yeah, Full Moon, man, you got to like uh, get on the app. Full Moon Features app. <laughs> How to subscribe. <laughs> That's not fun. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It's all, you get all of the movies that Charlie Band has ever produced. Some of my films, uh, Stuart Gordon films, like a lot, of, a lot of great genre pictures are there. Okay, cool. Now, I had a couple random ones, um, especially about Lauren, your sunglasses that you wear. Like I'm... Mm. What what's where did you guys find those? Because they're very like distinct, and I feel like they're an homage to something that I can't think of. Um, The Matrix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Those were sure. so cool. I like love those. Um, Courtney, who did the wardrobe, just killed it. She did such a good job. Um, all, everything that I wore, I was like, this is so like was such cool pieces that she found, and I. I'm in like eight different outfits throughout the entirety of it. Um, and each one was so intricate with different like jackets and, and accessories. So she really did such an amazing job. Um, yeah, I don't know where that, I think, I think she was really inspired by the matrix a bit um, for some of those looks. Okay. Yeah. With all the leather. Okay. Fair enough. Like your little bit of Morpheus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, um, for the for the actual like green drink that you guys use, what what did you make that of? What was that? You guys tasted it, right? I never tasted. I think that was literally like a like one of those pre made juice crafter juice craft um, those like pre made naked, naked, naked juice. juice. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was just oh, a, okay. The, the green machine <laughs> naked juice. Yeah, and they I don't know if they mixed it with anything else because. Um, I just came on a set and saw like a big bottle of yeah, the green naked juice. So I think that's all it was. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so nothing fancy. Yeah. No, no, we didn't have the budget for nothing fancy or to, to make up, mix up a special drink for them. Yeah. But it okay, fancy. So Movie magic makes you think it's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was expecting like half of like just weird ingredients or something yeah. like pig's blood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so not really for strength and creativity, just just juice. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that, those those health benefits though of the of healthy smoothies can promote some uh, good energy and maybe some creative some gut health. health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they would it was like Popeye and spinach after they drank it. Their mm -hmm. acting improved vastly. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> And I was also doing much better after my eight toaster strudels. So, <laughs> now, Nicole, your character is kind of averse to drinking it. Did you actually have it? Some of it in real life? I did not. No, sir. No, no it was not St. Patty's Day. So uh, I would I'd stay far away. I wouldn't drink it either. Yeah. Now, Cole loves health juices and benefits, and I'm I'm a very healthy. Uh, individual so i used to be afraid of anything green and healthy but as of the last like three years like give me give me all i'm i'm ready for <laughs> kale spinach celery <laughs> apple pear juice you know what i'm saying that sounds yummy i'm still afraid, afraid of green <laughs> hey, uh, it's, uh, it's good for you i'll take that advice now i also wanted to ask um so did, did you guys get any like homework for films to watch, like to prepare for your characters? Hmm. No, I, I mean, I, I rewatched um, Rosemary's Baby and Single White Female. 
which I that kind of came to mind when I read the script initially. So yeah, okay. I rewatched those. Okay. Yeah, I probably should have watched some of things. <laughs> I was just I was just living in the script and I and also I mean Ben is kind of self-explanatory I understood him and he is like he's the one that's kind of not in it or believing it and just has his own thing going on so like I kind of really got where I needed to go but um but yeah I, I definitely I've never seen Rosemary's Baby actually so I need to watch Ooh, that. you should watch that it's I, a great great movie yeah yeah yeah, yeah. There's there's two transitions in the movie where there's like fiction. I think there's like two movies playing on the TV. Are those uh -huh. fictional projects for the film, or are those some of Charlie's movies? They're some of Charlie's old movies. Yeah, I think one is uh, from Beyond or uh, uh, oh. uh, from Beyond or Castle Freak. It's Castle Freak, Stuart Gordon's film. We we tried to pay tribute to Stuart Gordon with those clips. Okay, so which one was which? The one with the was Castle Freak, the one with the creature sucking on the nipple. <laughs> I think that's that's Castle Freak. Yeah, yeah. And the other one, I'm not. Um, might be another part of Castle Freak. I'm not sure. Okay, fair enough. So, what was it? Was it cool for you guys working on a horror project? Yeah, I loved it. I think it. I mean, beyond the like scare of you know getting the blood gags right for one take that's the only like scary thing because when you can you can only really do one take of a blood gag which you know you got to get it right once so that's kind of scary but other than that like I mean it's it's fun you can kind of let loose and you know do you have freedom to like go as crazy as you want which is great Okay. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm a huge horror fan and, and um, I've always wanted to be in a horror film. I've always wanted to be the, the villain as well. So, uh, <laughs> one, day, one day, hopefully. The but, charming um, villain, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You think I'm a good guy and then the knife comes out. But um, yeah, no, it was, it was a blast. And obviously to work with Ted was such an honor. And yeah, man, we had a, we had a great time. Yeah, I, I, I would have got bloody though. That that's my only thing. I, you know, Ben, he doesn't get killed and no blood, and it was. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, I wanted to get eaten alive. Yeah, but you know what? The whole the 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 believability of the whole last sequence of the film kind of resides in not only in in Lauren and Kelly's interaction, but in Ben's reactions to it because as it gets crazier and crazier. The, the more grounded Ben is, the more the audience kind of has somebody to cling to too. So for me, doing horror films is really uh, a great kind of uh, form to practice in because you get to create atmosphere, you get to work with performances, you create, uh, you let your imagination go wild in, in various ways. And so, you know, it, it, when it all works out, it, it really is a fun genre to work in. Yeah, and exactly what you're saying with like, yeah, Cole, you, you're playing the, the character that like grounds everything. So that's a different challenge in itself of than playing a villain, right? Yeah, totally, 100%. And like, yeah, just that, that last sequence was so much fun to, to shoot. I had a blast <laughs> doing that. Yeah. And, okay. and the schedule, it, we were shooting it, it, it in such a frenzy that everybody had to kind of, I had to rely on each actor to kind of bring themselves to it and to and to be pretty damn good on the first take because that's that's kind of the world we were in is like we had to accomplish a lot in one evening you know and and then uh, with Howard uh, hand holding the camera he was able to bring the camera to the performances in a way that really helps to make it more real and and terrifying. Mm. All right, awesome. And hopefully you'll be able to play the, the villain next time, Cole. Yes. Yeah, we'll switch it around. Or maybe yeah. uh, Lauren and and Cole can be the villains. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Co-villains. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> but before we wrap up, I'd love to give you guys a chance to to, to plug Don't Let Her In again and or anything else that you're you might be working on. Lauren, go for it. Um, yeah. So 
watch Don't Let Her In, everyone, so you don't have to not watch this interview and then come back to it. You'll know what we're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys can follow me on Instagram at, at Lauren, L O R I N A doctor D O C T O R to see what I'm up to next. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, guys, check out Don't Let Her In. We had such a blast making it for you. Amazon Prime or Full Moon uh, Pictures app. Is it Full Moon Films or Pictures? Uh, Full Moon Features app. Full Moon Features app. Um, you can catch me on Instagram or Twitter at Cole Pendry, P-E-N-D-E-R-Y. And uh, if you want to keep up with my music, I make music under Ryder, R-Y-D-Y-R. -Y check that out. All streaming services, YouTube, whatever you want to do. Uh, appreciate you. Yeah, everybody check out Don't Let Her In on Full Moon Features app or Amazon Prime. Uh, and um, I'm Ted Nicolau. You can find me on Instagram at Ted Nicolau, T-E-D-N-I-C-O-L-A-O-U. Uh, a lot of things in the future. I'm gonna be doing Subspecies 5 coming up probably in um, October. So I uh, uh, hope you guys enjoy the film. All right, cool. All right, awesome. Yeah, so uh, writer, director, Ted Nicolau, uh, actor, Lauren Doctor, who plays Serena, the villain in the film, and Cole Pendry as Ben, who wishes he were the villain. <laughs> <laughs> and don't let her in. <laughs> exactly. Thank you guys for chatting with me on the film. Hey, show. thanks a lot, Daniel. Take care, man. All right. Thank you. Lauren, Cole, see you guys later, man. All right. Later. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. And as for my social media, you can find me on Twitter at Daniel Prin, uh, Daniel P R I N N, my website at filmcraziest.com, and on Instagram as at Daniel Prin, the same as the Twitter. Thanks for watching, and if you got this far in the video and you liked the interview, hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. Either way, thank you for listening. <laughs>